start then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so needless to say, I didn't prepare because Steve told me. He, but yeah. But but it's easy to say good things about Eric, as I'm sure m most of you or, or all of you appreciate. Um, so and so I, I won't have to take very long. But um, let's see. What can I say? Well, I think one thing that's really exciting about Eric uh, and my background is in math. Um, so as, as you know, Eric does computational biology, mathematical biology, but. Um, Coming, as coming from someone who used to be in math and now doesn't do any more, more math, and in particular, especially not any hard math, um, Eric and I've gotten a lot of you know I've gotten feedback from other people in the community. Eric still does really hard math. I mean, and and the impressive thing is that it's really hard math that's also really useful for biology. And so I think he's in a space that's um, that's unique or or almost unique in doing really proving genuinely interesting and deep theorems about things that then turn out to be um, very useful for. Um, for, for understanding the topology of spaces of trees and things like that. The other really wonderful thing about Eric, and probably if you're at the Hutch, you've all seen the signs. Um, what is it? Relax and oh, use he, galaxies. He, yeah, anyway, sorry. Yeah, so <laughs> Eric is, um, he cares about other people and, and allowing, enabling them to do science, you know, which I know it just seems crazy, right? <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, he is making, he's really, I mean, uh, making the Hutch a better place in, um, and in, 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 in the way that people can interact with IT and simulation. And so, um, you know, he's done many things in that space as well, setting up this discourse uh, uh, system to allow us to, to interact and, and, and get more things done on the administrative side. But also the galaxy thing is really cool too. So anyway, Eric is a fantastic scientist and we're going to hear about, I think, just a little bit of, of, of the, the things that he's done. So um, keep in mind that it's about 5% of, 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 of his work because he's been very... Uh, very productive since he arrived, and um, anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Great. <laughs> so I, I would say after such a, an introduction that I wish my mom was here to hear that, but actually my mom is here. <laughs> she came all the way over from Montlake, um, about two miles. Um, well, thank you for that very uh, generous introduction, totally off the cuff, so that's great. Um, so my purpose today is going to be very, very simple. I just want to explain my one-sentence elevator pitch of what our research is about. So that's going to go, let's see, maybe that's going to go? Well, I'll just use the keys. Oh, this. I know. There we are. Okay. So that goes as follows. So my group develops mathematical and computational tools for model-based statistical inference on continuous and discrete mathematical objects uh, motivated by evolutionary sequence analysis of microbes in the immune system. So let's just start at the beginning. What is model-based statistical inference? So to motivate this, I would argue that modern technology gives us the ability to observe in great detail. But observation is not the same as understanding. And to actually understand, we need to be able to simplify and abstract. So what abstractions do we have at our disposal? So this is a good one. Three. So three is a, is a really useful abstraction for for science, and we might, it's, it's sort of so simple and so every day that we might not even think about it as an abstraction, but it really is. Like, I can't have three in my pocket. I can have three coins or three manuscripts or three muskrats, but I can't have just three. Okay, so we're, we're going to keep on going up the abstraction chain, uh, and I'm going to skip over such crazy abstractions like minus two, zero, the square root of two, and even the square root of minus one, and we're going to jump straight to x. Okay, so x. So x is sort of a further abstraction because instead of just uh, having some abstract quantity, it's an abstract unknown quantity. So I would argue that x is really useful primarily because it allows us to describe knowledge in an implicit way. So we can make an equation like f of x is equal to y. And that tells us something about x. Even if we don't know how to solve x, it can tells us something about x. And then another thing we can do is we can do things like average. So we have a function, and then we, want, we might want to take the average of that function. 
So I'll just uh, introduce a little bit of notation. So there's this squiggly thing up here, uh, and there's b and the a. So that I'm going to call the integral uh, from a to b of this function f of x. But really, all it means in the context of this talk is we're going to take the area under this curve. So we can imagine this being a water wave, and then we sort of let it settle down. So we, maybe we put boundaries on this side and this side, and we let the water wave settle down. And so the average height of this wave in this range is just the, the level at which we've let the water settle down. So that's, that's going to be useful for us. So with these sorts of tools, we can solve problems like this. So here we have a cannon. The cannon has some angle. Uh, and there's some force that shoots a cannonball out of the cannon, and it goes a certain distance y. So you probably had to do this sort of problem in high school. Uh, so it's given y, solve for x. So the actual solution will be left as an exercise. But, uh, but this is the sort of thing we can do with these x's and y's and things like that. So um, another sort of thing that we can do is predict if we're given a 10% bigger charge, is it going to hit the castle? So this is a subject of some applied interest to the people that live in this castle. Uh, and, and so let's just say that the answer to this is hit 10. Okay. So, but the important point about this that I'd like to make is that this, allow, these, this little x allows us to solve in a deterministic framework. So it assumes that we know everything about the canon. There's sort of like no uncertainty as to like wind or the weird shape of the cannonball or anything. It's sort of like everything is deterministic. And so if we sort of extrapolate to what that world looks like, it looks like this. So what is this? Uh, this is a deterministic coin flipper. So it's an apparatus by which one puts a coin here um, and then uh, pushes down this thing and this has some weight and the coin flips and then lands in this little receptacle uh, each way at the same time. So this is not what I think the world looks like. I think the world looks like this. So this is another uh, coin flipping apparatus. So this coin flipping apparatus is activated by some uh, chemical reactions that happen here and there's this lever arm that lifts up in the air and flips the coin. But so in contrast to the previous one, there, is, there are so many uncontrolled variables in this coin flipping experiment. So, for instance, we typically don't know the precise length of this, uh, and this, you know, the strength with which this contraction happens is basically impossible to know. Even, uh, this platform may move up and down upon flipping the coin and so on. So there's lots of uncontrolled variables. This is much more the sort of thing that I think the world is composed of. So how do we abstract these probabilistic quantities? So not with little x, we do it with big x. So this is a really big X. I hope you guys can see that in the back. Um, so big X represents ran a random variable. So random variables abstract our normal variables, but it doesn't have sort of a fixed value. It has, we have to sort of ask it for a value. So oh hand, please flip as a coin. And, and these random variables are capricious, but they're really well defined behind this stochastic exterior. So for instance, we might have a, a, a random variable that takes discrete values. So here, this is, this, is the, the, this is the distribution of this random variable. And uh, so when we talk about solving for a random variable, there is really something we can solve for. We can solve for this number and this number. These form sort of like a vector, so just two entries that we might be interested in. We can also have continuous random variables where you can have a whole range of, of values. It just takes a, an infinite number of values. So now we can go back to our canon example and do something a lot more realistic. Ah, but first we're going to talk about solving for x. So this is kind of funny. Uh, for, by some quirk of history, when we take an equation like this, this is called statistics. Uh, I mean, there's lots of other domains in which this is called mathematics. But basically what we have here is we have, we have this random variable has the same distribution as this random variable. And uh, so then we, we might want to solve for this, and we denote that solution like this. We don't, they, they don't actually show f here, but it's sort of there. This is called inference. And then we can also average with respect to x. This is super useful. 
So here, this is the same solution of x with respect to y, and we can average out f of x with respect to that solution. So just to see this in action, so here we are back with our cannon. Uh, so now x is the, the elevation of the cannon, the angle that this makes with the ground. So, and then we have y. So y now is not just a single y. It's sort of that we have a collection of observations of y. So we, we think of y as being a random variable. And now we can set up, actually, with very similar sorts of situations, we can set up uh, f of x is equal to y, and then we can solve it to get this thing. So I'm completely sweeping all sorts of interesting things under the rug. But um, believe me that there are techniques for doing this solution. And, and now I feel like the integral really shines. Because again, if we're this person up here, we don't want someone to sort of take the best guess, best guess for x and then tell us, yes, definitely the cannonball is going to hit you, or no, definitely the cannonball is not going to hit you. We probably won't have a whole lot of faith in that person. We'll have a lot more faith if that person gives us a probability. And we can get the probability with this function here by taking this integral. So here we're integrating out the, the whether it gets hit or not with respect to this cannon angle. Any questions about that? OK. So of course, this is a metaphor. Uh, here we are in a biological research center. So our x's tend to be things like expression levels of genes. Uh, and our y, our observ observables, often are sequencing data. And from that, we, we oftentimes might, we, we don't really, we care about expression levels of genes, but in the end, we might actually be mostly be interested in risk. So we can integrate out our uncertainty in the expression levels of genes to get our overall estimate of risk. So this is the sort of thing that one might want to do in biology. So uh, hopefully this is just an entertaining quick tour of model-based statistical inference. So the idea is we can solve for x in these distributional equations, and we can find things. Uh, and if there's things that are important for our model but we don't really care about, we can integrate them out. So that's... Uh, that's sort of the end of that part of the talk. So what about uh, model-based statistical inference on discrete mathematical objects? So before we were looking at continuous objects, which is just this, the angle of this canon. But what about discrete objects? So to motivate that, um, the first project that I worked on as, as part of the, the Hutch was with Julie Overbaugh and superinfection. So superinfection is a separate infection that happens on a separate event. And there's all sorts of complexities that I'm not going to talk about. But let's just imagine that we have, uh, we look at um, viruses from two different samples. So say from two different time points. So we have this red time point and this green time point. So if those two derive from a single infection, we'd probably expect the tree to look something like this. So all of these, these sequences sort of seem to share ancestry. On the other hand, if we, if we think that there's super infection involved, we might expect it to look something more like that. So where uh, this, this green virus is quite different than the, the red virus. Any questions about that? So now what we would like to do is integrate out this phylogenetic uncertainty. Because so finding out these trees is really hard, and there's a lot of uncertainty associated with it, especially in the case of HIV. But we don't care about the tree. We only care about if it's super infected or not. So we can come up with a statistic, and this is exactly what we did, uh, come up with a statistic, statistic that describes super infection and integrate out the uncertainty. But uh, that, that's sweeping a little bit too much under the rug, even for me. So, so let's count, um, count your blessings for a moment. So real numbers are equipped with a total order. Um, real numbers are equipped with a simply computed distance that's compatible with that total order. And real numbers form a continuum, by which I mean that between every two numbers, there's another number. So this might not be something you sort of give thanks for on a regular basis, but you should feel very happy because with, with these three things, we can do things like we can define the integral. So we can take the area under the curve and divide it up into these little blocks. And it's, it's easy to compute the, the, the area of these little blocks. Uh, and then 
we can um, total them up and take the limit, making the blocks very small, and that gives us this integral. Okay, but this is, but no, I have this caveat for real valued functions. So before we were just talking about integrating out trees. So how do we go about doing that? Uh, well, so trees, on the other hand, uh, they don't, they have discrete topologies. There's no canonical distance between them, nor is there a total order. So we have to sort of make it up. So, oh yeah, but we still want to be able to do inference and integration in this setting. So this is, I'm going to be talking about joint work with uh, Chris Whitten, who's right there. Uh, and so we sort of have to make up the structure and give, give this structure to the space of phylogenetic trees. So we can start with just plopping all the trees down on the plane, and we can think about uh, think about what trees are close to what other trees. So one way of defining that is like so, this subtree prune regraft. So what this means is we have a tree, well, we have a tree, we have a tree over here, this 2, 3 tree, we cut it off, and then that gets taken away and then reattached over here. So here we have our tree with, the, with this 2, 3 subtree reconnected. So then these trees are, are considered to be distance one apart. So now we can take this tree space and connect all the trees that are just one subtree prune regraft apart. So this, I mean, remember, we needed sort of like a way of thinking about distance between trees, and this gives us that. So, um, I think I'm probably doing something. Okay. So tree inference bounces around this graph, and every phylogenetic uh, method that, that you've probably used, except for neighbor joining, does this sort of thing. So you start at one place in the graph, say we start right here, and then uh, you bounce around. So either you sort of only go places that improve the fit of the tree to the data, or you do this other thing called Markov chain Monte Carlo, whereby you start in one place, and then you jump to a new tree. And if that's a better tree, you stay there. If it's a worse tree, you stay there sometimes. So we're here, and if this is a slightly worst tree, we have some probability of, of, going, of staying there. But if it's a really bad tree, then we, we don't tend to not go there. So, uh, and then what we do is we do this jumping around process for a long period of time, and we visit all the different nodes. So what I'm thinking here is like, maybe you have a coin, an infinite supply of coins, and as you jump around the, this tree space, you put a coin each time you visit that place. So here, we visited this place quite a lot. So it's got a big pile of coins, and this one less, and so on. But really, it's, so the, the, the wonderful thing about this Markov chain Monte Carlo thing is, which I'll probably call MCMC at some point, is that if we run it for an infinite period of time, then the, the number of times we visit these nodes is precisely the number, the, the probability of that tree. So this is the most probable tree, and these are less probable, and so on, in, in a totally quantitative way. So um, that's nice, uh, except remember I said if you run it for an infinite period of time. So we don't typically run things for an infinite period of time. And uh, so it's interesting to, to figure out what happens if we run these algorithms for a finite period of time. So this is something that Chris and I started thinking about. And so Chris is very, he is definitely the world expert in this graph. Uh, I kid you not. And so we decided to take the graph. We can't build the whole graph at once, but we can make, uh, take one of these runs and sort of let it run for a while and then just build the subset of the graph that got visited a reasonable number of times. So that's what I've shown here. So here we have our... Uh, the places we visited, and we've just subset the graph to those places we've visited. And the big nodes we visited a lot, the smaller nodes we visited less, and, and the color is how close we are in terms of number of jumps to that top tree. Okay, so and this is what it looks like. And I don't know if you can really see it, but right here there's sort of a gulf between these two bits of tree space. So remember, each one of these nodes is a tree. So 
these two trees, if they're connected by an edge, then they're connected by an SPR move. And we can see that it sort of groups into these two different clusters. So of course these clusters are actually connected in the subtree, uh, in the complete subtree prune regraft graph, but there's sort of a gulf between them, meaning, meaning that we have to go through a low probability space in order to get from one place to the other. So, um, yeah, I'm afraid this is really all I'm going to say about this. We, we wrote a paper about this, uh, and you can look at it if you're interested in this sort of thing, but um, really all I'm going to say about this for, for the purpose of this talk is that graph effects matter. So uh, one might think then, what do we know about this graph? So given that this, is, this graph is the basis for all modern phylogenetics algorithms, I would hope that we would know something about this graph. But actually, we don't know very much about this graph. And in particular, we don't know very much about random walks on this graph. So Chris and I uh, also set out to learn more about this graph. So here we are. So these are two drunk guys, um, one here and one here. And, and we let them go, and they'd make a random walk on, on a graph. And we try to understand. Uh, is their distribution of positions, if we let them walk for a while, does that make it them closer? Does it make these distributions closer or farther away? So here, this is just saying, if let's say we let them walk for 10 minutes, uh, maybe they're here with this probability, here with this probability, here with this probability, and they stay in the same place with this probability relative to the size. Do, do those probabilities tend to approach each other or, or run away from each other? And so that's called curvature. So this is a picture of, of what it looks like when you have a positively curved graph. This is what a, a flat graph looks like. So here we can see that, that, that these distributions are neither getting closer or farther away. They're sort of like this one is the same distance here as, as they were when they started. And this thing's quite exotic. It's, it's called the Poincaré disk, and this is a tiling of the Poincaré disk. Um, and you can see that these guys they're really in bad shape. I, I mean, if this guy only has one way to go that gets closer, but every other way gets him farther away. And same with this guy, too. So if, if you don't remember anything other than this talk, um, just remember that if you're drunk and trying to find your friend, just feel thankful that you're not living on the Poincaré disk. <laughs> um, OK, but so we can an we've analyzed this. This is, I mean, all this stuff is very new. I mean, I. I it's like six months or something that we started thinking about this. But we have theorems that show us about what the different curvature in these different places are, and we can make graphs like this. So this is uh, curvature for six taxon trees. And what, so we have on this axis um, the curvature. So over here, this is the negative curvature. This is the flat. And then this is this positive curvature. And each dot here is a pair of trees. So this is. This is equivalent to a pair of our random walkers. So we have two places on the tree, and we let them walk for a while, and we see do they get closer or farther away. Uh, and this on this side is the distance, so how far apart they are when they start. And there's lots of interesting patterns you can see. So one is, it has to do with this color. So the light-colored dots uh, tend to be these imbalanced trees, and the dark ones tend to be these balanced trees that uh, sort of have even amounts of, of tree on either side. OK. Any, any questions about this? Lack of explanation. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that's something that we've been thinking about. So, so when I say model-based inference on discrete objects, that's what I mean. I mean, like, x here might be a tree. Uh, and so that, that's quite a, that has a lot of interesting challenges and opportunities for, for neat work. OK, so next I'm going to talk about proper biology. Um, and I, I mean, I am sort of emphasizing the methodological aspects here. I, I do get really excited about biology, I swear. But uh, I mean, I feel like I get excited about methods, and that's something that not everybody talks about in these sorts of contexts. Okay, So this is joint work with a lot of awesome people. This has been one of my favorite. Wait, Eric? Yeah. From the, you started out with a, a thing about trying to be able to see whether you could detect different types of, so has, has the methodological work helped you with that? that? Not with that. That, that methodological work is inspired 
by that. I mean, and so what we eventually want to do, and I'll, I was going to talk about that later, but I'll talk about it now. Uh, we would like to use this notion of curvature in our calculations of curvature to come up with better ways of moving around tree space. So ways that don't get stuck like that way I was talking about before. So if we had a way of jumping from one of those islands to another, that would be really nice. Um, and it would allow us to sort of run these algorithms less and be more confident in the result. Happy? Yeah. In that space, how, what is uncertainty in that space? So uncertainty is, so can I say posterior distribution? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what we, so you have a data set and you're inferring the, the probability of the different trees. So that's what I was call, talking about with these piles of coins. So that's called the posterior distribution. So the uncertainty is what is the tree? So the tree, the posterior distribution gets spread out across different nodes of the graph. And also there's a, a continuous part too. Okay. So adaptive immunity. Uh, so Jenner invented uh, vaccines in 1796, which was a huge advance, and we continue to feel the impact of this advance today. So it, it uh, goes without saying, it would be nice to sort of ask, like, where are we 200 years later? So we have all sorts of fancy devices, like iPhones and things, but we still, I mean, if we're talking about a vaccine trial, it's, it still takes a long time and is really expensive. <laughs> so, um, so vaccines manipulate the adaptive immune system, and the current practice for trials is that we stimulate the immune system and then we battle test the immune system with disease exposure. So that is um, maybe not the easiest way to go about it doing it. I mean, hopefully we could learn from these antibody-making B cells without actually having to expose people to disease. So what can we learn from them? So very briefly, uh, this is my cartoon understanding of immunology. So antibodies bind antigens. And this is a picture of an antibody. And the antigen fits in sort of over here. And this part here is called the heavy chain. And this part over here is called the light chain. Um, and there's really too many antigens that we have to bind. You can't just code for one antigen, one antibody per antigen. So the body's come up with this amazing thing. So I'm working on all this because of Hootie. So I have to thank Hootie for, for pointing me in this direction. Um, so there's these V genes, these D genes, and these J genes. And so the way you come up with one of these antibodies, which I'll be calling a B cell receptor because it sits on the outside of a B cell, is you randomly pick one V and one D and one J, and then they get deleted some random amount and then join together with some random nucleotides. So, and then that, that creates what's called the naive B cell. And then after that, there's a, a further process of sort of revising the antibody where you have these mutations. And if you have a mutation that makes the antibody bind the antigen worse, then it dies off. But if it makes it bind it better, it's allowed to reproduce more. And so you end up having uh, this evolutionary process, really fascinating evolutionary process that happens within each one of us. Okay, so this is our overall goal in this in this field is we have an individual, we take a blood sample, we sequence a whole bunch from them, maybe at adaptive uh, from, Har from Harlan, and we get a bunch of sequences, and now we want to go back and reconstruct what all of these little trees are. So each one of these, there's many, many, many of these, each, each one of these is one of these rearrangement events, and then these guys down here are connected with somatic hypermutation. So why do we want to do this? So we, you know, we might be interested in vaccine design. We might find a really good antibody somewhere down here, and we might want to figure out how do we go about getting this. So one thing that people have been proposing is doing a sequence of immunizations. So with the first immunization, it gets you sort of part of the way, and a second immunization gets you the rest of the way. We might be interested in figuring out what the actual impact of a vaccine was. Uh, and we're scientists, so we like finding things out. So we might also like to learn about the underlying mechanisms behind this. And 
if you know evolutionary biology in other fields is sort of uh, any sign, having these sorts of structures will be very helpful in understanding the underlying mechanism. So I'm not going to talk about the full problem today. I'm just going to talk about a sub-problem, which is, so we don't, let's say we just forget about these trees here, the, the actual trees, and we just want to infer which of these, these sequences sit in the, same tree, in the same tree. But we don't really care what the structure of the tree is. So we just want to go from this picture, go through sequencing, and then reconstruct this picture. This is still a completely impossible problem. but. Um, it's one way to split it up. So let, let me just step back and say this fits in the model-based formalism. So here we want to solve an equation, f of x, y, where now x is sort of this clustering thing, this thing down here, which, sequence go, which sequences go with which other sequences, and y is our sequencing data. So this is actually the way that we approach it. Um, but there's sort of an intermediate problem that some people have gotten obsessed about, uh, and we have just prepared a paper about. And so that is this. So remember, this is what the actual sequence comes out looking, or the actual sequence, is how it's actually made. We get a sequence that looks like this. It doesn't come with any labels. It says IMV, IMD, IMJ, or something like that. So. Uh, we have to go back and figure out, you know, which of these do we think came from which gene, or did it come from a non-templated insertion? So, I, I don't really like this problem, but uh, we do, we, we have worked on it, and so this is, this is, so this is the usual uh, performance slide that if you've gone to any CS or anything conferences, you see this sort of slide all the time. And so this is goodness. So good is over here and bad is over here. This is how frequently the different algorithms perform, uh, give those sorts of results. So uh, these are some other algorithms that have been made in the field. And this is ours. So ours is this red one. We can see it much better than everybody else. Uh, and, and if we have lots of sequences uh, that we know came from the same rearrangement event, we're able to do actually a lot better. So we're able to do this with a much richer parameterization of the process as before. But I don't want to talk about this, like I say. So um, I, this is x for me. A x is the thing that we want to integrate out. So let's integrate out x. And let's, uh, let's think about how we can go about doing that. And I'm not going to go into any detail, but here. Now, this is the kind of improvement that I like. So this is, if we, uh, this is if we take the best x, and then we do clustering using that best annotation of the sequences. We get performance that looks like this. And if we integrate out the uncertainty so that we're just looking for the grouping, we get much better results out here. So. This is, that's, um, all that is really Duncan's work. So he's actually out in California skiing and mountaineering right now, but um, he has done amazing work on this in a short period of time. Okay, so uh, just one last project to talk about, um, how are antibodies revised? So th let's, let's think about this, uh, this process of how they mutate. So. If, if anybody has been to a um, Mike Immerman talk, uh, you're probably familiar with this DNDS ratio, maybe Harmit's talk. So these large omegas are diversifying sites, uh, and this is purifying. So diversifying means that evolution tends to push this into the, dis the, the, the direction of more diversity. So we like novelty. And this is, we don't like novelty. This is so key, and it's so great the way it is, we don't want to change it. So we would like to do this for antibodies, but there's this complication. So in antibodies, there's this weird context-dependent uh, bias. So here, we're looking at two different situations in which we have a C to a G mutation. This is the same mutation, but in different contexts. So here, we have, start with an AA, and here we start with a GT. So, and the way that one typically talks about selection is by comparing synonymous versus non-synonymous mutations. So synonymous mutations are ones that preserve the same amino acid, uh, and non-synonymous ones are ones that change the underlying amino acid. So that is uh, annoying that we have to deal with 
uh, these two different competing processes that uh, that are context dependent and control the muta the fate of the mutation. So, uh, there, there's a purpose-built mechanism, this activation-induced deaminase, and it has specific places it likes to bind. And then there's a, another whole other complicated process in which part of the DNA is stripped out and this error-prone polymerase comes in and so on. So it's, it's complicated, but it's definitely there. And I mean, you can actually read papers in the literature that say it is not possible to do uh, evolutionary analysis on, you know, using these sorts of sequencing methods. But we came up with a way around it using these things called out-of-frame sequences, which I'm conveniently not explaining at all. <laughs> but, um, but uh, so Phil, who introduced me, uh, did a really nice job. So we, we, do, we do inference on this, and this is just an example of one such inference. Um, and so what we've shown here is we have this antibody, uh, and this is, we're showing just the heavy chain here in this cartoon. Up here is the light chain, over here is the antigen. So this is a crystal structure that was uh, created with bound antigen. And so now we can map our inferences on. And so it just is quite nice that these, these ones here, I didn't show this, but these ones are especially pure, uh, purifying selected. That's not quite the right way to say it. But they have especially strong purifying selection. And we can see that they have important functions. So this one especially is, is the most purifying selected. And it's sticking straight into the core of the antibody. And uh, so it has something to do with stabilization, presumably. And this one hopefully has something to do with connecting with the light chain. And we've done some sort of statistical analyses that show that these things that are in blue, these diversifying uh, positions, tend to be on the outside and uh, available to touch the outside world. So thanks to Phil for that. So um, in conclusion, uh, we like to solve these sorts of weird equations um, where x and y are random variables. We especially get excited when y is sequence data and x is something totally weird. Uh, so it might be a phylogenetic tree or it might be a clustering or something like that. Uh, and we can use these, these tools to learn about B-cell sequence evolution. So just very briefly, um, I'll, I'll give some ideas about next steps that we'd like to do. So in the first part where I was talking about phylogenetics, um, we would really, I mean, this curvature thing has been so fun, and um, I think it's really going to have some impact. So we'd like, and so, so far we've been dealing in sort of a completely toy case where there's no data. And we're just watching these drunk guys move around completely randomly. So we'd like to understand what is the impact of data on that curvature. Um, there's this, so the SPR tree space is one tree space. There are other types of tree space. Um, we'd like to, like I was telling Nina, we'd like to use this understanding to design bias proposals that get stuck less. That's probably what I should put there instead of don't get stuck. Um, and this is something that I've talked with Trevor about, how we can implement phylogenetic algorithms that update trees given more sequences. So right now, you have your tree, and, and let's say you're Trevor, and you are maintaining an amazing online database of flu, which he does. It's called Next Flu, and you should definitely go look at it. Uh, and so, of course, there's always new flu sequences coming out. So what do you do? Well, right now, you throw out everything that you knew. You start from scratch with your n plus 1 sequences, and, and you do all the, the computation. So it would be much better if we could have something where, where it would con sort of continually update your tree. Uh, and I've also sort of started online communities called phyloseminar.org and phylobabble, and I, I look forward to continuing those. So with B cells, uh, there's just all sorts of stuff to do. So I'm going to keep on working on this problem uh, with Trevor and Vladimir, who's a statistician at the UW, Vladimir Menon, really great, and um, Duncan and anyone else we can drag into this problem. But on the applied side, oh yeah, so we'd like to learn more about the mutation process. Uh, on the applied side, so I, I'm looking forward to at some point getting some data from Hootie and Corey about Kaposi sarcoma and learning more about that. Uh, 
with Denise and Julie, I would really like to think about how we can learn about protective antibodies and optimization of vaccine strategies. And Harlan has an amazing data set about um, sort of longitudinally watching people go through their lives, and it would be fun to look at how immune repertoires evolve through time. Okay, so uh, as Phil said, I've worked on lots of other things, um, and I wish I had time to talk about them all. I've had a lot of fun with Michael and Harmeet talking about um, innate immunity and viral antagonists, uh, also the origin of the chimpanzee HIV, which is called SIVCPZ, uh, with the two apostles, Peter and Paul. I've had fun uh, thinking about founder sequence identification for sieve analysis and other sorts of things. Um, with David Fredericks, Noah Hoffman, and Nina, we've thought about microbiome stuff. Uh, and we've had a really productive collaboration with Maxine Lineal's group and Lisa Jones Engel. So this is Lisa, she's at the Washington Primate Center about foamy and viruses and innate immune defenses against them. Uh, so the last thing that I would love to talk more about if I had time was HIV super infection and drug resistance mutations uh, with Julie. So Julie has been an amazing collaborator. Her whole team is fantastic. Uh, and so that's why she gets a special extra big picture there. Um, but continuing that theme of thanks, I'd like to thank the, everybody in my group. So here we are, this is 2012. Um, we, uh, we're all programmers then. So this is Connor. I think many of you guys know and have enjoyed working with Connor. So he is now at Google. Um, this is, no, no, he's not really, he, he's not my employee, but uh, we like to talk to him quite a lot. This is Aaron Gallagher I hired when he was 19, a, gen a boy genius programmer, and Chris Small who uh, left to do his own startup, but we're sort of bringing back slowly. So this is where we are now. Um, this is Vu, who's just joined us from Purdue with a stats background. Uh, he's already kicking ass, doing all sorts of neat things. I'm sure I'll be talking about his work. Duncan has just been fantastic. He came from MIT and has been doing all the, the B cell work. Chris Whitten, uh, all the sort of tree space stuff. Uh, and this is our gentleman scientist, uh, Arnie Cass, who has been really fun to have around. He's thinking about uh, likelihood and, uh, and sort of deep phylogenetics problems. And uh, Chris Worth, who's been doing the uh, reconstructing ancestral sequences and also been the point man for collaborating with the Overbaugh group. And Brian Claywell who is a great programmer that I have somehow convinced to work on galaxy type things. So for the betterment of the center. So uh, just more generally, I, I, I've only put up pictures of PI type people, uh, except for people in my group. Uh, but really, the staff scientists and postdocs and students have been so fun to work with here. And I thank them very much. Uh, the computational biology people, uh, so I. I don't know, in my mind, I call the sort of awesome group of young investigators the computational biology scouts. Uh, and then Marty, who has been very generous in every possible regard. Uh, Sarah, Melissa, and Anissa for fantastic admin support. Dirk, Carl, Eric, and Michael for doing great with the computers. Uh, the folks who have supported uh, fredhutch.io, which is this initiative with the Galaxy thing. That's Katie Peichel, Dan Gottschling, and Garnet. Um, and also Larry, Myra, and John C. for patience with my meddling in center affairs. <laughs> so thank you very much. Any more questions? In your in your trees, so you have these probabilities where you stick a coin in the trees that are better, you spend more time in. What determines better? Uh, yes. More time in that tree? Okay, so of course we take a likelihood-based approach. 
So what's done is you take a very simple model of nucleotide evolution, and good means a high probability of generating the observed sequences. Yeah. So you can imagine if we have like very similar sequences, but they're far apart in the tree, well, that's sort of unlikely that you would have two similar sequences generated in two very different evolutionary lineages. So it basically encapsulates that. Okay. But that's what the F is. Uh, Jesse. In the uh, antibody analysis, do you guys see the omega values going down as the sequence gets further away from the genome line? Like, through a Wow, that is a totally cool question, and I don't think <laughs> that we've thought about that. Have we thought about that? Oh, you know what? I know what this is. Trevor had this idea, and we were all like, oh, yeah, we're just going to get this paper out. So, yes, we, we should look at that. And, and Trevor is, yeah, aware that we should look at that. Thanks. <laughs> Jerry. Back to Katie's question. Or would you say that... Were you saying the two trees are closely related if it takes only one cut and regraft versus two cuts? Mm -hmm. That's how you're relating. That, I mean, so we have to come up with some structure on which to, to deal with tree space because there's sort of too, too many of them to deal with them all individually. So we have to sort of make a space out of them and then we can jump around in that space. So yes, that is the definition. Okay. So actually along those lines, I was wondering how special is that system? Do you think that's a this is a quite a representative distance. So you can, t so this is, I mean, in phylogenetic practice, in, in, in algorithms, one of the moves that people use is instead of like being able to cut it off and put it somewhere arbitrarily different, you just sort of rearrange it locally. You just say, these two guys that were like here, we're going to take this guy and move him just one jump over instead of able to move it all the way across the tree. And so that's called in and I, and yes, we are thinking about that. We recently had a visitor from New Zealand, Alex Gabrushkin, and he is working on that problem exactly. And then on the other end, there's sort of, so SPR, you have your subtree, and you have to re-glue it where you disconnected it, right? Uh, but you can also forget about that entirely. You can cut it off, flip it around any way you want, and then reattach it. That's called TBR. So SPR sits between N and I and TBR. So I feel like it's sort of a representative thing. But yeah, we uh, N and I is used more than TBR, so I think that we will be sort of more interested in proving things about N and I, which is nice because it's actually relatively easy to prove things about. A lot of the things that Chris had to work hard to prove in the SPR case are fall naturally out of the N and I case. Yeah, that is a very good question. So what Jesse's saying is that trees don't just have discrete topology, they also have branch lengths. So a long branch represents a long period of evolutionary history and a short branch represents not very much. And so you're optimizing or you're sort of moving around that space as well. So I don't, so remember when we had that, this graph where there was sort of one glob and another glob? I don't expect that sort of thing to happen with branch lengths, although it might, I guess. Um, Vu has actually been working on something sort of related to this. Like what is the shape of the likelihood surface just looking at branch lengths? But I don't, I mean, I don't think that that's probably so much a problem I mean, it's sort of, there's a natural, like, there's a natural continuum on branch length, so it's not so hard to jump. But I guess you asked, like, how this actually works. So what, what actually, how it actually works is uh, the program chooses a subtree to re-glue, and it, it sort of deletes the edge and then moves it somewhere else and also changes the branch length at the same time, or maybe it changes branch lengths around that place or something. Not necessarily. So it all depends on. So you're talking about the proposal, like when you propose a new change. Yes. 
Yeah, so typically those are drawn from a prior distribution, which is in this case often exponential. So it does prefer shorter branch lengths. I guess I should, should have said yes. But um, yeah, I mean, it does depend on the data. So there's the proposal, which is sort of how you decide where to jump. And then there's the likelihood that tells you, are you going to stay there or not? And so that part is totally determined by the data. Okay, thanks everyone.